Hello all, my name is Daryl Stover. I am here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I am the head of North Carolina Science Museum grant program, but I'm also a microbiologist, a science communicator, thus you see me wearing what I usually wear when I'm engaged in communicating science, this multicolored lab coat. We are going to have a wonderful nature hike through black stem success. But that nature hike is not the sort of nature hike like you see in what is in the background of where I'm standing, which is out in the woods. No, we're going in to the microscopic world to learn about the organisms there, but more importantly, an individual by the name of Harold Finley, who was uh, essential to uh, the success of a host of black STEM professionals, primarily zoologists who studied at Howard University to go on to great success at a host of institutions throughout the country. Where does this nature hike start? Well, that nature hike starts right here through the microscope. So, as we're looking, and let me focus a little bit just to see what we can see, but we should see some movement. Yes, we are looking in a drop of water, and in this drop of water right now, if we look closely, there are Paramecia moving around, Stylonychia, these names may be strange to you if you've not engaged the microscopic world. These organisms and their names may be as strange as dinosaur names are to some people. We are going to learn some of those names, but let's just take a further look at what we're seeing in this drop and focus on whatever we see moving. I'm going to move us about. Because beyond, ah, not only am I going to move us about, I'm going to focus in through the microscope. The microscopes are wonderful tools of science. They are about 500 years old, to be honest. And actually, the person who developed the first microscope was able to observe organisms like this and to write and describe them, which started this long history of the development and creation of what we have here, which is a compound microscope, not like the one that was first created 500 years ago. So let's now move from this journey in this drop of water where we've seen a host of things, which we will be coming back to. Because of most of what we're seeing are paramecia. And they, much like the organism we want to focus on, in this image here, this image is an image taken from, as we flip back to our uh, slide presentation, this image here is a photo that was taken here at the museum in our micro lab world by uh, Nancy, my colleague, and she has captured a wonderful picture image of Vorticella. And that's the image that you see in the left-hand corner as you look at this picture. You see a stalk, and you see what looks like an upside-down vacuum cleaner. Actually, on it are cilia, right? Cilia. Cilia, oh, that word means some might say hair, others might say eyelashes. In fact, eyelashes might be a better description 
because those eyelashes wave and move and create currents in the water that bring food, algae and bacteria, little one-celled organisms, algae, to the mouth of Vorticella. And Vorticella, yes, it rhymes with Coachella, are the organisms that were primarily studied and appreciated by Harold Finley. Harold Finley, who studied these organisms, he first started studying them, oh my goodness, let's see. As a scientist, you could say he got really started in the 1930s. But before that, he probably saw a host of different organisms. So when we say protozoa, in the upper left-hand corner, you see with the yellow background, you see paramecia, and it has cilia. And so all of the organisms in that group are called ciliates. In the upper right-hand corner with the dark gray background, that's euglena. It's almost more plant-like than animal-like, and it has one little whip like flagellum, as it's called, to help it move. In the lower right, we see another algal form called vovox, and they live together as a colony. And then to the left, we see slime mold, which is a, like a glob or blob that moves and slides. Amoeba are the main organisms that we would probably talk about, but with slime molds, they have many amoeba that come together and live together to create that organism uh, that so many times we see, yeah, when we go on hikes in the woods, we might see the slime mold on the side of a tree. But the organisms that Harold Finley studied were ciliates, vorticella. And who is this guy who we know as Harold Finley? Well, as I said, he studied these organisms in the 1930s, and here is his first published paper. As you see here, he studied the taxonomy of the Vorticella. In essence, at this time, he referenced that there were 200. This is 1931. And it takes a whole lot to uh, be able to have access to these wonderful research papers actually to hold in your hand, and I actually have them. There's an interesting story why I have all of these, these documents, uh, which I'll talk to uh, later on. But this is his first research paper, and as you can see, at that time he was at West Virginia State College, and uh, his close associate, Lil Nolan, was in, uh, as we see here, in Wisconsin. They reference that there were 200 different types of vorticella. Well, now we know there are a thousand. And vorticella live in ponds and lakes and rivers, but they also live in coastal waters and in the sea. So they are capable of adapting to and living in all of these various environments. Harold Finley, as we see here, wasn't just a scientist. When he was growing up, he played basketball. And he grew up in Palatka, Florida. And as you see here, he's in the lower right, uh, very much uh, an athlete. You should know this. Scientists do a lot of different things. We don't just do science. <laughs> we do things like all the rest of us, some of us have specialties. Some of us engage in writing poetry, <laughs> like I do. Some of us engage in playing basketball. Some of us also play instruments. And so here's another photo of a jazz group that Harold Finley played in. He is the gentleman in the lower right playing that trumpet. And for many of us scientists, creativity, whether it's in the arts or in the sciences, to gain new knowledge, 
we know is no different. It's all about play. It's all about um, experimentation. Musicians experiment with sound. Scientists experiment with the various aspects of the focus of their particular scientific discipline. With Harold Finley, it was about studying and gaining more knowledge about these organisms and finding even better ways to understand them, how to grow them. What do they tell us about the environment that they live in? How do they move? How do they eat? It's always good to ask questions in science. Scientists ask questions and then find answers. Harold Finley found answers to also how to use these organisms as a ways and means of teaching, of raising up new scientists behind him. When we look at his history, we find out that he studied zoology, the study of animals. And that particular field of science is what allowed him to focus on Vorticella. He got his doctorate in 1942 and continued on to teach and study at a wide variety of universities and colleges here in the United States, but this also carried him outside the country as well. But here in the United States, it was also important for him to get the money to support him doing that research. And it was also important for him to get that money in order to teach scientists. Scientists get support to do their research through receiving grants and grant money, um, let's say 60 or 70 years ago, may have been a challenge for someone like Harold Finley to access as an African-American, as an African-American at a historically black college or university. But Harold Finley didn't let that stop him. He continued showing the importance of his research and the value of it being funded as a ways and means for him to teach and train other scientists. So he was able to put the university that he eventually settled in to teach at, Howard University, in what's called the Research Grant Pipeline. And there are a host of different pipelines for receiving this money. Prior to him teaching and heading up the zoology department at Howard University, he taught for quite a while at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And Morehouse College is an important university as a historically black college because of the fact that, one, it was an all-men's college, and two, there are a host of people who studied there. Martin Luther King, Jr., studied there, yes. How many of you have heard of the filmmaker Spike Lee? Yes, he too studied at Morehouse. Howard Finley left Morehouse and went on to Howard University. And in going to Howard University, he was able to, this is Howard University, a nice, good drone shot in Washington, DC, which is actually where I grew up in Washington, DC. And you wanna know another fact? In the lower left corner of this picture is where Freedman's Hospital used to be. It's now Howard University Hospital. But I was born at Freeman's Hospital, practically on the campus of Howard University. Now Howard University is another important historically black college and, or university for the many, many great people who've come from there. One of them, how many of you saw the movie The Black Panther? as played by Chadwick Boseman. Well, Chadwick Boseman attended and studied theater, drama, and acting at Howard University. Kamala Harris, our vice president at the time, 
this day and time, she attended Howard University. And there are a host of others. Harold Finley went to teach and do research at Howard University, which sits on Georgia Avenue. <laughs> That's interesting. He taught at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, left there to go teach at Howard University right on Georgia Avenue, which is a major north-south thoroughfare in Washington, D.C. Here we see an image of Dr. Harold Finley on the left with his microscopes, and we see on the right a collection of illustrations of ciliates. Those are all microscopic organisms that have cilia, right? Those hair-like, eyelash-like organelles that allow for ciliates to move. And then there are some ciliates that don't move, that just attach themselves to something, and they sit there, and they use their cilia to create water currents that bring food items to them. That is what vorticella does. And actually, in the very center, lower part of this picture, is an illustration of vorticella. The other aspect of Harold Finley's importance, as you see here, is that the zoology department for graduate study, meaning being able to get a master's degree or a PhD doctorate, got established in 1958. So it took him about 10 years to get this all established. And it, at the time, was the department on the campus that produced almost the largest number of PhDs at Howard University. Interesting picture here, which might be a little difficult, but this picture is from 1961. It's in Czechoslovakia, in Europe. The first international gathering of protozoologists, meaning those scientists who study protozoa, these microscopic organisms. The first international meeting took place there, and there was over a hundred scientists there. And here you see Dr. Harold Finley at the center of the photo. He went there to also present his research along with others, and you had scientists from all over the world. He, of course, was the only African-American scientist in this mix, highly respected and regarded. What was the nature of the work that he did and presented? Well, let's see. Progress in protozoology. I referenced earlier about me getting a hold of documents. Believe it or not, this book, has about 600 pages in it from all those different scientists we see in that picture. And Dr. Finley's paper presented at this conference focused on the nutrition. What were the eating habits? What was it that Vorticella needed to stay alive? Also, what did Vorticella prefer as the places to live? So, as you see here, the title of the paper was Nutritional and Ecological Studies of Paratrix. That's the type of ciliates. That's a strange word, right? But these scientific terms have real meaning because that word ties to the fact that uh, Vorticella are special in certain ways. You see that his research paper lists his address as Howard University, along with another researcher there at Howard University. At the very bottom, which is what I found most interesting in 
studying this document is the fact that he lists the students who worked as assistants in the research lab. And some of those students were his special students. One of them was one of his first students to get his doctorate, Nathaniel Boggs. Interestingly enough, that research was supported by a United States public health grant, but he also received support from the National Science Foundation because he also created opportunities for students in middle school and high school to also work in the lab with him. And that's what I found really exciting. I wish I had had that opportunity to work with Dr. Finley when I was growing up. In that research paper, he has a map showing the places where he went to collect water samples in which to look for Vorticella. The Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in Washington, D.C. was one of those places. It, it sat across the Anacostia River from where I used to live when I was growing up in Washington, D.C. as a kid. The Aquatic Gardens is such a wonderful place because it has all of these lily ponds. As you see here on Earth Day, folks are in there working hard to collect samples. You see the two young ladies up at the top right picture. They have on, uh, they have on water togs, pants, to keep them from getting wet so they can go in and collect and clean just in case some, something wrong shouldn't have got in there. You know, certain pollutants, bottles, somebody comes to the park and leaves a bottle, where does it end up? Yeah, in the pond. So we, they check that out. But this is an oasis in Washington, D.C. And you go there in August and you can see these wonderful water lilies in bloom. It's one of two favorite places that I have in Washington, D.C. The other thing about the aquatic gardens and Dr. Finley going there to collect samples is he also took his students that studied under him there to collect these samples. And actually we see two of his former students here that went on in science to do great things. We see on the left, Nathaniel Boggs, and on the right, James Olivieri. Both of these gentlemen were the two initial students of his to go on uh, with their doctorates and do research elsewhere, going on to research in other government locations, like the National Institutes of Health, as well as to also go to other colleges and teach and raise up other scientists. And that's how science survives. It's through education. It's through scientists working with one another and identifying subjects of significance that can be supported by research grants so that that science can continue to produce new knowledge so that new ways of understanding the world can be made manifest. And, and certainly new ways of understanding the world are important when we look at these organisms here. Let's, let's go back to that, that drop of water and see if there's anything specific else happening there. And of course it's still very active, it's still a host of animacules, as some called them in one particular period in time. In fact, I want to focus in on what we see that's so active at the edge there. I can focus on that. Paramecia and others. They are still active and moving and active, understanding how they move. And, and, and you might want to take note of how they move. They're moving fairly fast, to be honest. And some are moving slow, but most are clearly moving. It'd be interesting to come up with a way to measure how fast they are able to move in relation 
to how we measure speed, right? Kilo kilometers per hour or miles per hour or feet per second. Ah, that's a possibility, but I leave that up to you to figure out. Let's, let's go back to uh, the students of Harold Finley. So Harold Finley ended up being the president of several major organizations. And one of those organizations was the Society of Protozoologists. And actually, he presented a paper in 1969. It was actually his pres president's speech at the end of the term that he had served as president. And in that paper, he talked about what the paratrix have taught us. And one of the points that he brought out was they gave us ways to use them to teach science to raise up more scientists. And so I think it's important to note for him as, as well as, and he, he had a good sense of humor because he, he started out his, his presentation with saying, yeah, I've looked at many of the other previous president's speeches and I've come to the conclusion that yes, I'll be speaking with you for two and a half hours. And then he laughed and said, no, that's just a joke. It's important to open up your speeches with a joke just to loosen up everybody. So, no, I won't be speaking to you for two and a half hours, he said. And, and of course, neither will I be speaking to you for two and a half hours. But, again, he pointed out the opportunity that these organisms presented to him to use at Howard University as well as his traveling to other countries, Italy, Brazil, Czechoslovakia, to teach the methods that he developed for, for growing these organisms, for studying them under the microscope, and understanding uh, how they operate. Here we see several illustrations of the paratrix, right? As I said, they look like upside down vacuum cleaners, or some may say an upside down vase, or even an upside down bell, right? These are the, that's how you, you, you get descriptive. That's part of science too. You find ways to illustrate and you find metaphors or ways of describing what you see or what happens. And one of the points that he's making is that they have those wonderful cilia at the top there that operate. And you can see some of them, some of them here that are, that are illustrated. And these are all different types of vorticella that we're seeing here. We're seeing a way for understanding the different types of vorticella in this illustration, which was very important to him to show. Uh, and one of the contributions that he made was coming up with a way for showing how different the many vorticella are. Here is Dr. Finley in two photos. One, outside the biology building in the top picture with his students on the campus of Howard University. And in the lower picture with his students in the laboratory. And as you see, everybody has on a lab coat. Now, my lab coat is multicolored. They're wearing white lab coats. It's important when you do science and, in your, and you're in a lab, one, to protect your clothes you have on, too, right? But I think that look is important. I, I long for the days when I was in college and we had to wear lab coats in class and everything. I think I'm going to get me a couple of other lab coats to wear. I like this one. Don't get me wrong but I want to wear a white lab coat just like them in that lower picture. Um, it gives me that feeling of being a scientist. Uh, actually, in front of one of the students are a host of Petri dishes, and in those Petri dishes, that's where they're growing the vorticella that they study and learn from Dr. Finley uh, other ways of understanding uh, their value. 
Certainly looking at Vorticella with the compound microscope is one way of understanding them. But there's another microscope, a much more powerful microscope called the electron microscope, which is something that I use to look at viruses when I was engaged in working as a research assistant at the National Cancer Institute. But yeah, in this picture we see also the fact that all of these students seem to be quite happy with being in the presence of Dr. Finley. Many of those students always spoke of him quite fondly. That biology building that they were standing in front of has now been named the Ernest Just Biology Building. Ernest Just was at Howard University prior to Harold Finley coming. Ernest Just started out studying science and went on to uh, contribute to our greater knowledge about the cell membrane. What's on the outer edge of the cell and how does that change under different conditions? There's even a major book written about him. There's a stamp and there's a children's book, The Vast Wonder of the World that just came out last year, year before last. Anyway, as we look at Ernest Just and his contributions, it's important to note, for me, I think Dr. Finley's contribution is even greater. I actually was sent several many of the journals that Dr. Finley's work fits in, but I was also sent a wonderful publication that examined uh, the zoology department from 1906 to 1979. That's 70 plus years of history. And in it, it shows where students ended up going after they studied and got their degrees at Howard University through studying in the zoology department under Dr. Finley and others. And we see this list here, and on the right you see many went on to teach and lead historically black colleges and universities, doing research at these universities. Some went on to the private sector, like I said, to the National Institutes of Health, and some went to other major colleges and universities. So the program was quite successful in regards to training folks. I use that word alumni. You know, you're an alumni. You know, whatever school you attended, after you've left it, you're an alumni of that school. Even your elementary school, even your middle school, even your high school, and yes, even your college. And you should always look back at the important things that those institutions provided you. And when you look at the significance of what your experiences were there, you should be able to talk about that and maybe even go back and help. Some would say go back and give money, right? That's what alumni do. But the important uh, point here is this, this book was put together at Howard University to look specifically at the alumni who came out of the zoology department and points out the significant contribution that Dr. Finley made while there. That's one way that they uh, present uh, these institutions and what the students did. Here is a listing of what they've done and their special contributions. Uh, not going to go through and read this list, but we also can see that starting in the late 50s, early 60s forward is when we start to get these students with their doctoral degrees. And it's important to note, many of them went on, as I said, to teach at other colleges and universities. Will Sutton, in the lower left, is someone I met. His, his son used to live here in the Triangle and was the deputy manager of the News and Observer newspaper. But they were originally from Louisiana, and he's, he's gone back there and everything. And it just so happens, as I was studying this document and I saw the name Will Sutton, I said, oh my goodness, Will Sutton. I called him and I said, Will, did your father go to Howard University? He said, yeah. I said, did your father study zoology? He said, yeah. I said, did your father know Harold Finley? He said, oh yeah, that's all he talks about. Now, Will Sutton also went on to be the vice president and president of a host of colleges and universities in the Midwest. 
He also taught biology and zoology more specifically. But my good friend Will Sutton Jr. talked about his father used to always say, yeah, people see me as this great education leader, but I'm a scientist. And I'm a scientist because I studied under the great Harold Finley. So he had that much excitement in his voice around having had that experience of studying under Dr. Finley. Other students that we see here also went on to great success after studying Dr. F under Dr. Finley. And as we see here, this whole notion of using the microscope, that tool, the tool that we use to just look at these microorganisms here, uh, is an important aspect of what that experience was. And he was a phenomenal, if you would say, master of using the microscope and training in on understanding ultrastructure. That means the fine details of an organism and teaching his students to be able to do the same. These students that he's with also went on to learn how to use the electron microscope. So we could get insight into that fine structure and detail of vorticella and other organisms. The zoology department in and of itself has had all of these great successes, even after Dr. Finley. Several of his key students went on, uh, as you see uh, in the top photo, both of these graduates went on to establish the biology department at Gallaudet College in Washington, D.C. And Gallaudet College is a major national college uh, for the hearing impaired. And both of these women scientists went on to establish the biology department there uh, at Gallaudet. The gentleman in the lower picture with an afro, just like mine, he went on to study specifically the organism that causes sleeping sickness, which is a protozoa. And so he learned his skills and his interests were fine-tuned to focus on that organism because it has major impact on people on the continent of Africa, and for him that was important. And he went on to make major contributions, including those studying DNA and RNA within those organisms, the trypanosomes as they're called. Here's me at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. My son Darius snapped this picture of me, and yes, I, like I said, I like Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, so much so that I go there and I get water samples. In this particular photo, I am next to a one holding a wonderful uh, hibiscus blossom. They, those grow right along the edge of these water lily ponds, and they look great during the summertime as well, so you would probably want to go check them out. Um, this photo I use as the profile picture for my Facebook page, which is called Black Naturalist which uh, I encourage you to check out if you have. So if you so desire to see more about what I engage in. This photo here is a photo that I took based on getting the water sample from the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. And here we see three vorticella on their stalks, that upside down vacuum cleaner or vase or bell, if you will. Uh, attached to a stem. Yes, wherever I go, I like taking water, getting water samples to check and see, are there any vorticella here? Actually, Dr. Finley proposed that they might be an indicator species of great use for understanding the water quality uh, in areas. He and other researchers have looked at this. Interestingly enough, you know, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and I just recently acquired uh, from my younger brother, just last year, what my mother must have been holding on to, which is actually um, my first place science fair certificate from when I was in 11th grade 
at Northwestern Senior High School, just outside Washington, D.C., around the corner from the University of Maryland College Park, where I went to go study microbiology, among other things. But it's important to note that in those documents, as I perused and looked through them, I found out that some of the other things that Dr. Finley did was that he also worked with science fairs throughout the Washington metropolitan area as a judge. And in fact, when I first received the copies of the science journals that were published to pay tribute to him when he passed, and I opened the journals and saw the photos of this tall, fair complexion, African-American man with bow tie, I immediately was able to say, wow, this guy judged my science fair projects back when I was in high school. And I always did a science fair project with a microscope. I was given a microscope for my birthday, I guess maybe in seventh grade or something like that. And I did science fair projects from eighth grade forward. And yeah, Bethune Junior High School, eighth grade, first science fair project was entitled Pollution and Protozoa. And yeah, I actually ordered the protozoa that I used in those experiments from the Carolina Biological Supply Company, which is where we <laughs> have these organisms that we're looking at. I went on to do another project that examined parasites, especially those parasites carried by particular flies uh, in the state of Maryland. And was able to engage the sort of research that they were doing at the Patuxent Wildlife Center. But my real celebration in science in high school with my science fair projects are the projects that I did in my 11th and 12th grade year. So after you placed in your science fair in your high school, you were able to then go and compete in the county science fair. And so in getting first place in my 11th and 12th grade year in high school, I was able to go to, as I did also with the other years, but in competing in those science fairs at the Prince George's County Science Fair, which were held in Coalfield House on the campus of the University of Maryland College Park, 11th grade, symbiosis in the microscopic world. Symbiosis, what does that mean? Living together. And actually, in that image you see there, it's green, right? Those are paramecia, but living inside them, living with them, are algae, one-celled plants that engage in photosynthesis. I was just having a discussion about photosynthesis with my granddaughter just earlier today. And so, yeah, symbiosis in the microscopic world. And, then, and, the, and the algae that are in those paramecia are chlorella. So I decided to do a science fair project in my senior year on chlorella. And what effects do organic substances have on those one-celled green plants? I got a first place. And who was one of the judges? Dr. Harold Finley. So I came in contact with him and had no idea until I started researching his legacy at Howard University and received those journals and saw his picture to be able to say, wow, I did come in contact with this great scientist. So yeah, you might want to ask your mother and father, aunt, grandmother, friend, to get you a microscope because there's so much to see and learn. Now, I like one-celled organisms. I like microbes. I like looking in the water and seeing what's swimming around, like we're about to go back and look at. But you might want to study something else through the microscope. But consider it as one of those real tools that you can start with now, and you can become a great scientist within a host of different fields where microscopy, as it's called, you know, and I mentioned to you he was the president of the Society of Protozoologists. Well, I got a real tongue twister for you now. He was also the president of the American Trans Microscopical Society. And say that three times. Let me hear you. 
you got it. <laughs> Say it real fast. <laughs> so as we move forward in this presentation, again, microscopes are important. Those microbes in the water are important. And studying what's in a drop, and we're going to go back and check out our drop now, studying what's in a drop of water is important because you might see something like this. This is another photo from uh, our lab here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So I thank you for joining me. I thank you for taking an interest in Harold Finley and zoology. More importantly, I thank you for continuing to take an interest in the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. These are my sources. And now we'll go switch back to that drop of water and we will also see what we have. And we'll also see, are there any interesting questions that might have been sent in to my close friend and associate here at the museum, Chris Smith? The first question that came in, since these protists are swimming so fast, did they have a way of slowing them down back in the days so they could study them better? There have been ways for slowing them down, even back in the days, but even now. There, well, there, there's an actual product <laughs> that is called Proto-Slow, and there are others. Um, you, you just add these sorts of things, you, you know, you, thin powder, cornstarch, those sorts of things. Uh, but yes, even back in the day, there were probably ways of slowing them down. Uh, certainly. Here we see that some, because of the sediment in the water, yeah, they're sitting, who knows, maybe even feeding. We see others in the background, but those sorts of things slow them down as well. Another one. Since these organisms are mostly transparent, is there a way to stain them so you can see them better? Oh, yes. In fact, there are filters that exist on the microscope. There are ways of staining for very specific, depending on what inside the organisms you want to see. Uh, there's ways of controlling the light and brightness. Uh, you can use diffused light. And so, yeah. And, and, and for Dr. Finley, it was about seeing the cilia. So sometimes it was important to do very specific things so that you could focus uh, specifically on seeing the cilia uh, and how they operated. And then there's a comment, what an essential role Dr. Finley played in the lives of so many people. It's fascinating how microscopic life had such a profound influence on Dr. Daryl's professional life as well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think I know who that person is calling me Dr. Daryl, almost like Dr. Dre, right? No. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Finley, certainly with what he's done, has had quite an impact on me in these latter years after I found out about him. To be honest, uh, there's an interesting story behind that. Uh, when I was working on my graduate degree in science communications and science writing and had to write about a scientist, I knew Harold Finley Jr., his son. And Harold Finley Jr. was a retired dentist and poet. And I happened, he knew that I was, what I was studying and I mentioned I was, he said, so what are you, what are you working on right now? I said, well, I'm trying to determine what scientists I want to write about and study in this program I'm in. And he said, well, you should study my father. I said, okay, fine. Let's, oh, that's right. You're a junior. So your father's name would have been Harold Finley. He said, yeah, he was at Howard University. I said, oh, wow. So when I looked it up, I said, now, as I recall, when I was studying microbiology at the University of Maryland College Park, there were some folks there who talked about this great scientist that used to come out there and teach workshops, and several folks were excited about him. So I called up my former college advisor, Dr. Emil Anderson, and asked him. He said, well, Daryl, I wasn't here. I heard about him, but I never got to meet him. 
you should call the zoology department on campus. So I called the zoology department and, and they, they said, well, we are sure Dr. Corliss, who is retired, would want to talk to you. Here is his phone number. He lives in Arizona. I called Dr. Corliss and told him what I was doing. Well, Dr. Corliss first, he, he thought about my name. Daryl Stover, you're a poet. I said, yes. And you were our campus's first black president of the student government, right? I said, yes. And you're looking into Harold Finley? And he said, about darn time. That man, and then he started to tell stories and ask for my address, and he sent me these great works. He includes uh, Dr. Finley in, because he was also a historian of science, especially of the history of protozoology. And so he considers Dr. Finley a part of that long tradition of microscopists who studied protozoa, going all the way back to Antonin Leeuwenhoek, right? Who was the first person to create a microscope. And so he published a paper with images of all of these individuals, and there is Harold Finley also in that listing. But he also provided those journals that I looked at as well. The photo of Dr. Finley in Czechoslovakia, believe it or not, I had friends that on the weekends we used to go to the Library of Congress to hang out. Yeah, we were blurreds, black nerds as, they're, as we're called. And we would go there to also research and think about what science fair projects we do. And there was a book I used to come across called The Progress in Protozoology. Big, thick book. I'd always check it out because it had all this research. Turns out Dr. Finley had an article in there. I showed it to you earlier, the one about nutrition and ecology of paratrix. Didn't know him then. I looked at the images and all of that to get ideas. Well, I decided once I got to thinking about it after Dr. Corliss had talked to me about this, that, and the other, and saw that Dr. Corliss was involved with that conference that took place in 1961, I decided to get a copy of that book because I valued it so much. And, and so just last year, I was able to find it. I believe it was on eBay. And when I turned to the page with all of the scientists and they had a key that described who's in the picture, there was Dr. Finley standing in the center there. Here was his article, his paper, research paper in that book. So, yeah, this has been a wonderful journey for me to examine his life and his contribution. And I think the other opportunity is there to look at, well, who were those students who went on from him? And from him, who were the students that learned from his students? That whole genealogy, that whole tree should give us some great insight into the whole notion of uh, STEM success, especially relative to uh, black scientists, African-American scientists over the decades. And there's a, an opportunity for looking at that in the context of other HBCUs. To be honest, there's a biology building named after uh, a good friend of mine's grandfather um, in Durham, North Carolina Central University. Uh, J James S. Lee is the name of their biology building. He was there from 1938 to 1963. Now, he didn't study Vorticella, but he did use the microscope because he studied bacteria, those other microorganisms, right? And over that time from 1938 to 1963, he most certainly had impact. They named a building after him. And so it'd be interesting to see, well, who were those students who studied on, under him? And what did they go on to do? Uh, certainly um, his son, Jim Lee, uh, who was actually, his history is important too, because he was instrumental in starting the first jazz radio station here in North Carolina, which was up near Warrington. Uh, but as an artist, he incorporates natural science. 
and things from the natural world into his art. So it's important to consider all of these opportunities for further research to delve into how we get a handle on understanding and celebrating the success in uh, STEM disciplines. Now for me, STEM situates itself around biology and more importantly, microbiology. Um, and so when I look at a Harold Finley, I'm able to attach myself rather readily because why? I love the microscope and I love what you can do with it and what you can see. Do we have any other questions or are we fine? I wanna say again, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. I wanna also encourage you to take a nature hike through a drop of water that you've collected and put under the microscope. I'm Darrell Stover at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.